good day. Welcome to the Far Eastern University Public Intellectual Lecture Series. My name is Rita Cusho, and I am from the Political Science Department. Our topic for today is neuropsychology and how it is used to explain moral behavior. And we are privileged to have with us a practicing psychologist of the MLAC Institute for Psychosocial Services and a professor of De La Salle University, Dr. Rachel Ann Rosales Parr. Good day, ma'am. Hello. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be oh, part of this yeah. public intellectual lecture series. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, ma'am, uh, can you please give us an overview of what neuropsychology is and how it affects moral behavior? Well, uh, very, very briefly, uh, neuropsychology is like understanding behavior uh, by looking at brain uh, processes. So, this particular topic, um, is understanding how we become moral beings, moral creatures, um, through the lens of um, neuroscience, neurological science. So I'm not a neurologist, but uh, in psychology, part of our training is that we use scientific models to explain, to describe, explain, and possibly predict uh, the behavior of people. All right, so that's very interesting. So now we're talking about the brain, right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so ma'am, what is the relationship with, between the brain and how individuals make ethical decisions or generally decision making? Um, okay, that, that's a huge question. No? But um, the research, I actually did a lecture on this. So I have a PowerPoint presentation on this. And here in this presentation, we I will be looking at how uh, I'll be talking about how empathy starts out, um, how individuals why do individuals engage in risk taking behavior? Why is this so salient or prominent in adolescence, as we all know? Um, and then how a conscience develops. Mm -hmm. Um, these big concepts, uh, lately, we have, research has shown that um, research in evolutionary biology, in cognitive neuroscience, and in developmental psychology have shown that the moral development of a person, mm -hmm. you know, how a person knows right from wrong, has its biological roots mm -hmm. and can be influenced mm -hmm. by a person's genetic makeup and oh. brain processes. All right. That's yeah. very interesting. So yeah. can we talk about that, ma'am, about the moral development of an individual? Uh, okay, so in, in the branch of science we call evolutionary biology, so in this lecture that I did, uh, this is in, I hope I can give you a copy of this mm -hmm. now, in the third slide, we talked, um, I will show how evolutionary biology looks into how people are the same, okay? The universalities of mm -hmm. behavior. Okay, we are individuals and we come from different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but there is something universal also about the way human beings behave as a species. And there are even universalities where we behave the same way as other mammals, like other primates. Um, so evolutionary biology looks at these universalities. Okay, so part of that is the universalities in our moral behavior. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, how are we the same as uh, animals, uh, primates? And then also we look at uh, cognitive neuroscience. So here we look at um, brain processes, mm -hmm. how the brain processes affect how we perceive, how we understand what's happening, how we, how this translates into action and behavior, and then vice versa. Uh, cognitive neuroscience also looks at how our experiences, how our behavior mm -hmm. reshapes our brain mm -hmm. and affects the structure of our brain. And then Developmental psychology, well, this is the systematic study of the changes through the lifespan, mm -hmm. the changes a person goes through, physical, emotional, social, etc., and also moral. Um, 
so in developmental psychology, we use scientific theories to try and um, describe and explain these changes throughout the lifespan from birth to rather from womb, mm -hmm. from conception to death. Okay. Um, th it's a long, it's, it's a rather big topic actually. Uh, I'd like to go back mm -hmm. to the topic on evolutionary biology. Uh, because here, a group of scientists led by a social psychologist, rather, um, led by Jonathan Haidt, okay, he came up with a theory um, ex uh, talking about the moral foundations mm -hmm. okay, of uh, moral behavior. So apparently, uh, as I said, no, so people are different, individuals are different, mm -hmm. we have different cultural backgrounds, but um if you look at the moral behavior mm -hmm. you can actually categorize the different value systems that people have mm -hmm. into five major categories okay. based on his studies one is you know we we behave our moral behavior can be put together in terms of how we care for one another how we cherish each other mm -hmm. um on the other end of that spectrum is harm no harm is mm -hmm. the opposite of caring mm -hmm. And then the other principle is about fairness mm -hmm. and cheating. So how we value fairness, how we value justice. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so the, here you will see the traits of um, how social conscience mm -hmm. um, evolves. And then we also behave morally in terms of loyalty. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would seem that people uh, value belonging to a certain group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, whether this is belonging to a school, mm -hmm. belonging to a UAAP team, mm -hmm. or belonging to a family mm -hmm. or a barcada. So it's very important for human beings to have this sense of belonging mm -hmm. to a particular unit. And this sense of belonging leads to um being loyal being mm -hmm. matapat in tagalog no um so the opposite of that is betrayal no mm -hmm. and then the fourth principle is about how we how we give importance to authority mm -hmm. okay so respect um how how do we respect one another how do we respect people who have a legal sense of authority mm -hmm. so our professors our government officials etc and then the fifth principle is about uh, sanctity and degradation so how we behave morally in terms of how we value the purity mm -hmm. in our bodies uh, the people we relate to so here you will have the issues on Okay, like same-sex marriages, mm -hmm. for instance. So how do we see this? How do we decide on these issues? So do we, are we open? How open are we mm -hmm. to these, uh, to this, to same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. for instance? For two people uh, belonging to the same sex and having a relationship, um, or do we find this disgusting? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that continuum. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the fifth. Mm -hmm. um, so there. And then, um, in a biological sense also, when uh, we looked at the research, it was in the 1990s uh, that we, that this group of scientists led by um, Giacomo Rizzo, Rizzo, Rizzolatti, rather, mm -hmm. sorry, um, they discovered the presence of a set of neurons mm -hmm. that seemed to mirror mm -hmm. Um, behavior. So the, the the experiment they were doing was with monkeys. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what they found out um, was that a certain when you when a when a monkey behaves in a certain way, like for example, picking up a banana. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a slide on this. I think it's in it's in the fifth slide. Mm -hmm. When a monkey picks up a banana, so a certain set of neurons fire up. Mm -hmm. Uh, light up uh, and then 
when the monkey observes the same behavior in another monkey, mm -hmm. the same set of neurons will light up. Oh, so this is for yes, young people yes. to say mm -mm. what is right and what is wrong, especially mm -hmm. when you have uh, people supposedly modeling moral ascendancy and yet they don't seem to model what they're supposed to model. So can you please elaborate on that, on the development of one's conscience? Um, one way of studying conscience mm -hmm. okay, is by looking at this concept we call um, mutually, uh, mutually responsive orientation. Okay. Mm -hmm. In a presentation, in the same presentation that I did, mm -hmm. okay, where is this? Slide 58, mm -hmm. okay. There's a scan here, an MRI scan of a, this is actually a mother um, kissing her baby. Mm -hmm. okay. But this could be a father, doesn't have to be a mother. So in the scan, they were able to see that when a parent and a child begin to interact, when they first interact, there is that exchange of positive reactions, mm -hmm. um, mutual exchange, no? um, just the sound of the voice, being happy to be with the child, the, the touch of the parent kissing the child. These um, forms of interaction, they, they saw that these um, actions would light up certain parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. And they were the same for the parent and the child. And so scientists explain this by saying that when this happens, there seems to be like what we call an imprinting. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the parent, uh, there's an imprint mm -hmm. happening in the brain. Okay, mm -hmm. the parent suddenly feels this. Uh, I think if you talk to some parents, they will probably explain it differently. But there's this sudden sense of this surge of, Oh my God! This person is mm. this baby is the most important thing in my life. Mm -hmm. Now I would die for this child. I mean, you know, very extreme, but that's how um, some parents describe mm -hmm. it. It's very primal. Mm -hmm. It's very. I am now responsible for this person. I will die for this person. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And then for the child, naman they explain it that the child imprints that. Okay, th the sound of your voice is the same as that sound I was hearing when I was in the womb. Uh, it must be the same. Uh, must, it must be you, your smell, um, the way you touch me. Putting mm -hmm. that all together, mm -hmm. the child imprints on that. Th the face of that parent becomes imprinted that this mm -hmm. is the person who will take care of me. I or I need to attach to this person. Mm -hmm. Attachment studies show that children need to attach. Mm -hmm. Whether the parent is uh, nurturing or not, mm -hmm. they will attach because it is a biological need to attach. Mm -hmm they need to be cared for so there so when this locking in of uh, positive emotions mm -hmm. when this takes place this atmosphere of what we call a uh, mutually responsive orientation is created mm -hmm. okay and in this um, okay if you look at it from a neuro perspective mm -hmm. they would say that during this time uh, this is slide 59 now in that presentation now, so I jumped. Um, dopamine is a neurotransmitter. Dopamine levels increase during this time. So there is, again, a neurological manifestation mm -hmm. when a mother or when a parent and a baby mm -hmm. start this bond. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. We, we call it mut uh, mutually responsive orientation mm -hmm. in psych, but th that's it. No, That's mm -hmm. that bonding, that moment that they lock in. Mm -hmm each other and um, so this is when the attachment begins when this mutually responsive orientation is allowed to develop mm -hmm. through positive interaction positive exchanges between parent and child mm -hmm. so socialization begins mm -hmm. um, children develop this sense of wanting to cooperate with that parent. parent. So this is where children learn how to absorb mm -hmm. gradually mm -hmm. the value systems, the what is important to the parent. They begin mm -hmm. to absorb this. Okay. Of course they don't oh, they may not show it readily na anything my mom wants I'm going to do. It, it's yeah. not as black and white as that, mm -hmm. but they they absorb this sense of wanting to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This sense that is it's not 
really just conscious eh. It's actually subconscious. Mm-hmm. You, you know how young people talk about, you know, they're, they're outside, they're with their friends, and then yeah, they really want to mm-hmm. do this thing, but they know their mom or their dad's going to get yes. upset. Mm-hmm. So that, that conscience, mm-hmm. the conscience, yes. okay. Mm-hmm. It starts as early as infancy. That's what I'm trying to uh, explain here. Um, that sense starts with that mm-hmm. bond that you form with your parents. So th- mm-hmm. that's why it's very important to have mm-hmm. that positive relationship as early as infancy. Mm-hmm. Because that is when, supposedly, this conscience begins to develop. See. All right. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting because now it appears to me that parents are responsible mainly for developing the rational pathway that you were mentioning earlier because it is the parent that tells the child, this is what you should do, this is the acceptable thing to do. But it is actually the peer group who can also influence the emotional pathway and there's where the confusion yeah. starts. Yeah, and it's not just telling the child mm-hmm. actually uh, if we go further into this it's living it's it's giving a living in a way that you become a role model also I see. so you ju- you're not just telling the child but it's the action also you also have to show that you you know it shows your sincerity you, you lead by example also ah. okay so of course there is the verbal ah. exchange there is a mm-hmm. communication process that mm-hmm. happens but the child needs to grow up in an environment where mm-hmm. the child will believe you. Mm-hmm. So you need to lead by example. And mm-hmm. this is not just with parents. This is also in an educational setting. Yeah, the figures of authority. Exactly. I and see. the teachers, okay. the administrators. Ah, all right. Okay. Those of us who are supposed to be molding them mm-hmm. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, ma'am, um, I'm just curious because there are certain... There are certain issues now that we take up in or that we encounter you know, being, being teachers. Um, and these are issues of, let's say, sexuality and you know the development of values of our young people. So how do you weave through the the neuropsychology part with these challenges of you know sexual behavior among our young people, even uh, addictive patterns of behavior and all that? So you were saying earlier that uh, experiences matter, and when we talk about the rational pathway, these young people, as young as 15, Mm -hmm. already know what they're supposed to do, Mm -hmm. but the emotional pathway gets into the picture uh, and the emotional pathway is yet to to develop. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see how, you know, how these variables like sexual behavior and addiction, even depression and suicide weave into one big issue among our young people today. Mm, wow. Okay. I, I would like to see how the the adolescent brain works. For example, how does it look like? Okay, as be- compared to an adult or to a young child. Because in adolescence, as mentioned earlier, they're, they're creating connections, but at the same time, they're also getting rid of mm-hmm. connections that they don't use. So mm-hmm. during adolescence, the the shape of your brain, the structure of your brain, really goes through a very dramatic change okay it, they call it like uh-huh. a dramatic overhauling okay. okay so what overhauls this mm-hmm. what shapes this mm-hmm. is experience mm-hmm. okay and that's where we come mm-hmm. in um do we teach them values of social justice do mm-hmm. we teach them to be open-minded do mm-hmm. we teach them to be accepting mm-hmm of themselves and of other people. Th- these experiences we can do as parents and as teachers. Mm-hmm. And this is how we help structure their brain mm-hmm. in such a way that they are socially aware, that mm-hmm. they are mindful, mm-hmm. that they, they value social justice, mm-hmm. that they are able to go beyond themselves and help other people. Mm-hmm. This is how we teach them how the important, how it becomes natural for them mm-hmm. to be selfless. Okay. And not just to think of mm-hmm. self-preservation, not mm-hmm. just be about self-preservation, but also be to 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 start, you know, this altruistic tendencies, mm-hmm. how to become altruistic. Mm-hmm. It's up to us to give them that experiences mm-hmm. at home and in school. Okay, ma'am, thank you for that. So, ma'am, I just have some very specific cases here, and sure. I'm just curious about how psychological processes affect uh, these kinds of behavior, or Mm -hmm. maybe should I say misbehavior. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the human brain when uh, a person gets involved, for example, in crimes, or let's say rape and other forms of sexual violence, like Mm -hmm. sexual harassment Mm -hmm. and domestic violence? Okay, Uh, rape in itself is, uh, well, again, it's 
you know, there are many factors or ways of trying to understand why a person would rape another person. And um, so you have gender issues there. You have the the gender issue of, you know, men feeling more powerful than women. Rape is about power. Rape is not about sex. Uh, but then you have these pathological cases where, you know, you have children, babies uh, being raped by an adult, mm -hmm. whether it's their father or their caregiver. Yes. Okay, now, now, as mentioned earlier, now those are very extreme cases, but mm -hmm. if, as mentioned earlier, we are born to feel, uh, to bond with other people, we are born to feel compassion towards those who are weaker than us, those who are more vulnerable than us, which is why when you, are, when you see a child, you naturally feel different. You're, you're more willing to help a child if a child is hungry, crying, uh, even though you don't know the child, you, you are more, you're triggered by the, the, the child mm -hmm. being a child, you know, that person being a child. Now you want to help, you mm -hmm. want to do something for that child. Mm -hmm. So to do the extreme opposite of harming a child, raping a child, is really a clear sign that this person, there's something pathological about this capacity for empathy. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, um, you know, in psychology, we have this clinical condition we call um, uh, social pathology, mm -hmm. psychopathology. So these are people who have no conscience mm -hmm. and they are not capable of bonding with other people. Mm -hmm. So this could be brought about, this could be caused by experiences in childhood. They were, they're born with this pathology. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's not, you cannot just pinpoint one source, no, but this is a condition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a, an adult is capable of doing mm -hmm. that uh, horrible act mm -hmm. uh, with a very helpless infant mm -hmm. child, okay, then it, it, I think it's safe to say that this person has no conscience. Mm -hmm. So if we use a neuropsych mm -hmm. uh, perspective, then we could say that this was damaged during the time that it was developing. Mm -hmm. It was not it was not able to develop normally. Mm -hmm. It was not strengthened, mm -hmm. or perhaps it was damaged by mm -hmm. trauma, by mm -hmm. abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many cases of abusive people who became abusive because they were also abused mm -hmm. as children. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one way of looking at it mm -hmm. and understanding it. All right. Understanding it. Okay. How about uh, cases where I think most students can very well relate to, um, like cases of cheating, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not only cheating in exams, but also cheating in relationship partners. Yeah. How, how do you explain the psychological processes there? As we mentioned, as I, I mentioned earlier in the uh, earlier part, um, we, one of the moral foundations we have is the sense of um, fairness. Okay, uh, being fair or cheating, no? So uh, that's the uh, other end of it. Mm -hmm. So we, if if your sense of fairness, if your sense of wanting to be fair, um, is not honed mm -hmm. properly, is not encouraged, is not reinforced mm -hmm. by experience, mm -hmm. then chances are you will still have this, but it will be weak. Mm -hmm. So for some people, it might be weaker. Mm -hmm. They're more prone to cheating. They're more, um, they succumb to temptation mm -hmm. more than others because this sense is weaker in mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So it could be upbringing, mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. it, it was not strengthened. Mm -hmm. So we're all, we're all wired to have this, mm -hmm. to be like this. Mm -hmm. That's what the theory is saying. Mm -hmm. But you need the outside world mm -hmm. to strengthen it. So even though a person, mm -hmm. as a child, as an adolescent, can construct this mm -hmm. sense of morality on his own or on her own, na hindi, you shouldn't cheat, you should be, loyalty is a virtue, you should, uh, when in relationships, it is important to, to stay in this relationship, you need to be like this, you need mm -hmm. to be faithful, etc., etc. You can construct this on your own, but how strong is that mm -hmm. against temptation depends on how it is addressed mm -hmm. by the environment. Mm -hmm. So can, can the brain catch up? Like for example, you had trauma when you were young and then you had all of these bad experiences and then it affects the brain. So how does the brain catch up for okay. you to be morally upright? Yeah, so that, that was actually one mm -hmm. part in this lecture that um, 
uh, a huge part of this lecture mm -hmm. is also about brain plasticity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so plasticity uh, means uh, is this capacity of the brain to respond to the demands of the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, for example, there are damaged parts of your brain. Uh, other parts can be triggered mm -hmm. to make up for the mm -hmm. damaged parts. For example, mm -hmm. ha, um, I'll go back to that point. Mm -hmm. when, when a, a person who cannot use his hands, mm -hmm. um, some people learn how to write with their feet. Mm -hmm. So those neural connections are cre uh, created and that is the brain, that's plasticity. That's the brain responding by creating new connections mm -hmm. to respond to that need, to that mm -hmm. damaged part. Okay. So, so the same thing, of course, there is always hope. Mm -hmm. okay? um, a person who has been traumatized or abused or is incapable of being fair or being just, given the right experience, mm -hmm. yes, it is possible that this person can mm -hmm. reconnect with society mm -hmm. in a healthy way, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. it, yes, it is possible for an antisocial person to become pro-social mm -hmm. given the right experiences, which is why mm -hmm. we have rehabilitation centers, which is why, you know, we don't, we're not supposed to kill young people or people mm -hmm. just because they're taking drugs, mm -hmm. okay? That, that drug-taking behavior is mm -hmm. supposed to be a manifestation mm -hmm of something else. There is something that caused them to do that. Mm -hmm. So we should help them. Mm -hmm. right? that, that's the idea. That's the rational behind it. We don't kill them. Mm -hmm. Because we're we, we, we believe that th there is always hope. Mm -hmm. No matter how dire or how dark the situation is. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, um, I think in applied ethics, now you talk about crime and mm -hmm. what do you do. But um, you, you, you can remove a person from society if mm -hmm. this person is a danger to society. Mm -hmm. But you don't remove a person by killing the person, mm -hmm. supposedly. But we rehabilitate the person. We well, that's what we should want, restorative yes. justice, yeah. uh -huh. not punitive. I see. Yeah. So um, for your final word, ma'am, I think uh, this topic is actually very interesting because yeah. You know, many of our young people are actually struggling you know, with ethical decisions and it's important that they know that uh, the brain, no, the plasticity of the brain, no, that they can relearn new things and they can actually adopt given the right experiences. So, um, what are your final words for, for our students who are listening to us now? I'd like to end it with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. I think um, he's quite well known. <laughs> okay, according to him, a man is the sum of his actions, of what he has done, and of what he can do, nothing else. Now, if we believe that the brain is the physiological um, representation of who we are, mm -hmm. then I will say that you are your brain. Your brain is you. Mm -hmm. My brain is me. I am my brain. Okay. So therefore, if we believe this, it is very important that we bear in mind, those of us who deal with children, those of us who are in the molding mm -hmm. of children, in the business of molding children, of educating children, then it is important that we remember mm -hmm. that these connections begin very early on in life. So mm -hmm. it is important to provide the right connections. Mm -hmm. And in adolescence, the young people go through mm -hmm. the reshaping of the brain in a very dramatical way. Mm -hmm. So it is important that in adolescence, uh, in while they are in school, mm -hmm. it is important that we create the right experiences mm -hmm. so that the brain gets shaped in a way mm -hmm. that they are pro-social, mm -hmm. that they learn how to bond with other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, in adulthood, we can only hope that mm -hmm. all these experiences become crystallized. Mm -hmm. So the, the brain becomes crystallized, mm -hmm. less flexible, mm -hmm. but crystallized with the right lessons in life. Mm -hmm. so that's what we can hope for. All right, so uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for, for your time and for this explanation. I think our students will have a better understanding of how their brain functions and relate this functioning with their own experiences. So thank you, ma'am, for, your You're very for welcome. your time uh, and <laughs> for your expertise, no? for sharing with us your expertise. So there you go, um, another session. I think my two key uh, takeaways for, for this session is... Number one, we have to take care of our brain, of our mental health. And number two, I think it is very important that we are very responsible in choosing the kinds of experiences that we engage in. So there you go. Uh, thank you very much for your participation in this session.